Well, thanks everyone. You've been incredibly patient. Uh, we're still not gathering Nick to join, have him join here and trying to figure out what the, what the technical difficulty is. Um, thanks for being patient as we troubleshoot it. We're working on troubleshooting. We'll go ahead and proceed, I think, with the discussion, hoping that he's able to, to join us um, as we get going here. So thank you for thank you for your patience again. I know it's frustrating when you sign in and we say six o'clock sharp and you show up and we, we haven't done anything yet. Um, I'm Brandon Reinches, the senior curator here at the Missoula Art Museum. And the image that you were just looking at for so long is Nicholas Galanin's piece. I think it goes like this gold. It comes to MAM through a art, generous Art Bridges lending program. And we're so pleased to have been hosting this piece for the last several months. They've been an incredibly supportive partner for our single object exhibitions. And recently we also received support through the Bridge Ahead initiative, which provided digital programming support during COVID. So you, you, you hope for a, an institution like this, a partner like this that sees you through the thick and the thin. Uh, likewise, we're also very grateful to the from support from the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts for um, some of the programming support here. When we when we received Ashley's um, email that Art Bridges had acquired Nicholas's work and was making it available to borrow, we we reached out immediately. We signed up immediately, and with a with the shift in COVID schedules, we had an opportunity to present this work um, immediately as soon as it came from the Peter Bloom Gallery, which is such an unusual situation, both for, for museums uh, and lending institutions to have something turn around that quickly. But that's the beauty of Art Bridges is that they, they uh, make things happen uh, directly like that. We, as many of you know, who are longtime MAM supporters, we've long held a dedicated focus on contemporary native artists in our Linda M. Frost Contemporary American Indian Gallery and through the MAM collection. And partly that's because MAM sits on the ancestral territories of the Salish and Ponderé peoples. And we really respect the indigenous stewards of this land where MAM sits. We have really come to think of, of these rich cultures as being fundamental to both the artistic life that we find across Montana, and then especially to the work that we do here at MAM. And so that's a great focus in our collection. And one of the programmatic focuses that really allows us to pursue projects uh, like this lending program. So we're really excited to welcome this piece by Nicholas and to show his work here. If you know and, and follow his career, as many of you do, you'll know that he's an artist who's on the fore, forefront of challenging perceptions about contemporary indigenous art and identity and display uh, all the time in his practice. The other thing that we're really grateful um, both to Nicholas and to Art Bridges for is, is their generosity uh, in supporting MAM's efforts to forge friendships with these art hosts uh, across Montana's seven tribal reservations and with the Little Shell tribe of Chippewa Indians who are currently unlanded. And then here in Missoula through the All Nations Health Center. And despite our commitment to contemporary indigenous art, we've never had connections with all of Montana's tribal communities and to do so is really of utmost importance to ma'am. So thank you to Nicholas and thank you to those who are serving art hosts and I just wanted to let you know who they are uh, and read their names here because they're, they're such a generous act um, to champion Nicholas's work within their communities. So thank you to Aaron Laframbois, uh, Lena Buffalo Spirit, Camille Carter, Chelsea Onsir, Co Carew, John Murray, Lauren Small Rodriguez, Michael Gray, and Samuel Enemy Hunter. And if any of you who are plugged in right now. I'm, I'm seeing how many participants there are on the screen. Um, if any of you are plugged in right now and are attending tonight's event as a result of one of these wonderful people who are acting as art hosts, welcome and really thank you. Nicholas uh, received his BFA from London Guildhall University in England and then went on to 
get his MFA at Massey University in New Zealand. And he speaks about both of those um, as being really transformative experiences to his practice and his, and his uh, identity as an artist. And he's apprenticed with master carvers and jewelers, including his father, uh, who is really renowned. You probably know his work because he participated in the most important exhibitions of the last several years, including the Venice Biennale in 2017, the Whitney Biennial in 2019, and the Biennial of Sydney in 2020. And if you follow uh, art history news or, or art news, art in the news, you'll you'll notice that Nicholas was at the forefront of those exhibitions and, and some of the um, protests and public communications there. He's been named a United States artist, a USA Rasmussen Fellow in 2012, and he's collected uh, in all the major museums across the country. Ashley uh, was recently promoted as Associate Curator at Art Bridges, and we were so excited to receive that announcement uh, just two weeks ago. Prior to her time at Art Bridges, she was Assistant Curator at, of Native Art at the Eidljorg Museum of American Indians and Western Art in Indianapolis. And that's a trajectory um, that has put her on the path of, of MAM uh, with simultaneous uh, concern and, and focus on Native artists. She's a doctoral candidate at ABD in art history at the University of Oklahoma and is folk in Norman and focusing on indigenous identity, cultural memory, and is issues of diaspora and Cherokee contemporary art. She's received her MA in museum studies previously from Indiana University Purdue uh, in Indianapolis and has a BA in both art history and religious studies uh, from Greencastle, Indiana. She is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and currently lives, lives in Rogers, Arkansas. You'll notice that tonight's event is being recorded and will be available both on our webpage and our YouTube uh, after the fact. We, we're happy to take questions um, using the chat function or the Q&A function. One of the things that we like to do at MAM is to make these conversations really uh, dynamic and interactive. So if as we're speaking about the work, if you have something that you'd like to, to query, please use those two functions and we'll, we'll see one or the other. The other thing I was gonna point out is that after the event, you'll find a link to a survey in the chat box. And I hope that you'll take just a minute to complete the survey. Um, it's, it's a Google survey, so very easy. Just buttons to click about how happy or unhappy you are, how, how illuminated you've, you've become from the discussion. Um, so please do us the favor of, of letting us know how we're doing. If you haven't seen the exhibition, it's here through April 24th, and we hope you can make it to MAM and see this amazing piece of American art. Thank you so much. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm sorry about the, the kerfluffle and the snafu with, with Nicholas, and hopefully we'll figure out a way to, to get him uh, joined in the conversation. Like you said, it's not a Zoom presentation without some sort of a some sort of a some sort of a, a stumbling block, right? Just gotta stay on our toes, which is always fun. Yeah, this uh, you've had you've had so many interactions with Nicholas over the years, both at the Idol Jorg and in your present position, and even this the particular body of work mm -hmm. that this uh, piece has come come out of that I think it goes like this gold and I'm just going to share the piece again so people can can look at it as we're as we're talking about it can you tell us a little bit about uh, your past experiences with him sure so um, Nicholas was a part of the Idol Jor Contemporary Art Fellowship and that was where really I interacted with another version of this piece the, the first version, which is called, I think it goes like this question mark. Um, so it was still sort of in that formative, formative state. And that work is um, completely covered in black paint as opposed to the gold leaves. So it's really been very exciting to watch the progression of the work from the original, which was black. And then I think it moved into red and now this iteration, which is gold. And anyone who has spent any time in an art museum understands sort of the connotation of gold leaf and that it's very much associated with, you know, the precious, with 
frames and these aspects of presentation within an art museum. And so to see it used in this way is in effect, it's turning it on its head. It's using a material that is unexpected or the material is expected within the museum, but they're using it in a way that's unexpected. And this is especially a piece, I, I'm always a fan of works that encourage a considerable amount of viewing time for somebody. You know, they say somebody in a museum maybe spends five seconds looking at um, a work of art. And this is not a work that you can get the entire, you know, feel for it in five seconds. You really want to spend time with it. And what happens as you're looking at it is images start to become familiar through it. What looks like a pile of gold leaf and cut up wood starts to feel a little bit more familiar, especially if you have any, you know, understanding of Northwest Coast totem poles. And so you might start seeing those form lines coming through and the wings and different animals and different faces. And what happens is that I think for Nicholas, he's wanting you to think about it. What, what are you looking at? Why is it put in this way? Why has it been deconstructed in this way? And it really opens up a larger conversation that goes beyond cultural sort of imagery. And what it gets to is economy, which so much of Native art is wrapped in, you know, commerce. And this work is actually, instead of being a cultural object that was created by a Native carver who, you know, learned about it through their family and had the access to different imagery that they were allowed to put into the piece. This is a completely commercial object. It was created by a carver in Indonesia and then shipped over to the United States to what is now known as Alaska to be sold in the tourist trade and really to undercut sort of the cost that a, a traditional carver, a, a actual artisan from the Alaskan native tribes all of that cultural patrimony, all of that cultural knowledge that goes into the totem, none of that is a part of this. And it becomes just a commodity that can be purchased by a visitor and taken home and sort of used as a placemaker for their experience within that space. And so once you start to realize that, you understand that this is saying a lot more than just a, a breakdown of material, but it's actually talking about a breakdown of culture that happens through the commodification of cultural objects. Boy, I love, I that, love that interpretation. That's really uh, amazing, a breakdown of culture that comes through commodification. I wanted to thank the attendees, everybody, even though Nicholas isn't here, I, I'm seeing that nobody's dropping dropping off of the um, webinar like oh, good. Out, of, <laughs> out of despair. Uh, we did just get an update from Jenny that he is in fact having internet connectivity issues at a studio and is headed home to um, jump on and see if he can make a better connection. So, so thank you. The thing I love is that you, that you have such a, a thorough understanding and knowledge of both Nicholas's practice and this piece in particular. And um, it's such a mystifying piece. I, we've been talking to University of Montana students and other visitors about the arrival of the piece here. And when it arrived, it was in two separate crates. Each of the pieces was wrapped individually. Um, and there wasn't really a clear idea about which piece goes where or and what. There's no map. <laughs> there's no map. And we, we reached out to Art Bridges and we reached out to Nicholas and said, what what do we do? And it was kind of like, well, that's the point, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's completely, um, it's this piece that very much relies on the space that it's in and the hands that are recreating it each time. Um, there, there's some, you know, aesthetic aspect to it. You want it to sort of pile up. You want it to exist in a, a singular sort of either on a platform or within a contained space but the piece itself changes every time it goes somewhere. And I think that's such a wonderful metaphor for 
just Artbridge's works in general, because our collection is constantly on the road, they're in new locations all of the time. And seeing a work of art in one space is gonna look totally different than the way you see it in another space. And this piece definitely has that aspect to it. The, the thing that was so unsettling from, a, from an institutional standpoint, um, myself as a curator who is working to install it, uh, comes from a non-Indigenous background, and, and I suddenly was wrapped up in the decisions and politics of, make, of deciding how this piece goes together. And, and I think that that's the brilliance of his work is that he, of course, I do that on a daily basis, right? And you have to negotiate and navigate those decisions. And uh, the team who is installing it became very aware of, of our complicity in, in that process. And he's, he just, it was a great moment that he could point it out um, without judgment, but just say, here, here is your opportunity to put this together in the way that you see fit. Absolutely, and it, it talks to this larger responsibility of institutions. If we're thinking about how, how indigenous objects are in so many museums and what a fraught history that is, that these are, museums have not been safe spaces for you know, native objects for a very long time. And now I think museums are really starting to reckon with that reality and they have been for a while. And that, that feeling of responsibility extends into contemporary art production and wanting to care for those objects. And this is sort of an example of an object that isn't precious in the sense that it is not connected explicitly to culture. It is precious because it is a work of contemporary art. It's precious because it's covered in gold leaf, which is a, a fragile material. Its preciousness is different than those earlier objects, but still we want to sort of consider it in the same way. And with this piece, did it have an exhibition history before it went to Peter Bloom? Um, you know, I don't know. I should have looked that up. <laughs> I was thinking about that later. And I was, I was also thinking about those other iterations that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And the one I'm most familiar with is the, the piece that's clad in black, which mm -hmm. has a whole different series of associations. And that was one of the things that we've been interrogating was the use of gold and, and the history of gold and extraction and and what that means. And also how how the Tlingit and, and Aleut uh, view gold, what, what that is. And maybe Nicholas will will speak about that when he's here, but just a, just a remarkable piece in that way. Um, one of the things that I don't, I don't think that people can see through Zoom, through through this digital media, is is really the fragility of the of the object in the wood and and that that act that is so violent um, breaking up this form. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that, that balance of, of fragility and destruction. Yeah. Yeah, these, you can't really tell from this image, but these are not cleanly, you know, cut up pieces of wood. This is very much a piece of wood that is experienced sort of violence. When you look at it, there are, there are pieces of, you know, wood that will fall off over time because it, it was cut up with an ax and then the outside was gold leafed on top of it. And so there's that, that example and that violence is very much present as a part of it. The thing that really shocked me in, in the process of installing it, sometimes I think you learn so much about a piece or an artist's intentions when, when you have the, the privilege of being able to, to place the object in space, was how tenuous some of the connections were. They were literally uh, thinner than a matchstick holding a one piece of wood together to another. And I think about that and the metaphor there um, and just what that, what that means for how he's expressing his idea about, about culture and, and, the, and the resilience of culture and the continuity of culture. I think it's, it's such a beautiful um, way of stating things. 
Yeah, I think that that survivance of culture is much more embedded in there than sort of destruction of culture. And that that's something that's really important to constantly keep in the back of the mind when viewing Indigenous art, that it, it's very much about survival. Mm -hmm. Oh, here he comes. Not sure if everyone can see this. Welcome, Nicholas. Hey, sorry about that. Not at all. Sorry that you had to uh, had to move so quickly to make it happen. Sorry, right. I live in my studio is not really far from here, so but I was not having any luck getting the internet to work there. So that's great. Well, I'm glad you glad you made it, and I hope it's it's not too jarring to join us. <laughs> no, I'm here, I'm ready. I'm sorry for the holdup. Not at all. Uh, we were. We were mostly just talking about the the piece in your career from a from a third person perspective. Oh, nice! What I miss? Oh, it's great. <laughs> all, all of the intelligent comments. <laughs> Ashley had such brilliant insights, um, and I think it's good. So I was going to shift gears here and say that the the intention of this um, talk was to have a conversation between Ashley. Uh, and Nicholas, who know each other and, and have had this long relationship, and I'm just filler. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute myself and disappear and, um, and let you two go ahead. And if you need anything from me, uh, just send me a chat and I'll be here. So thank you for joining us. I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to make it and figure out the internet issues. Thank you for persevering. That's great. <laughs> All right. Thanks for continuing on. Okay. Well, I will. Hey, how are you? I will. I will take over now. So we were we were talking a little bit about just the the ideas behind your work and the overall. You know, I think it goes like this series. And I thought maybe you could talk more. Where where did the idea for the series come from? What was the the source for? You know, where did you find these totem poles that are then deconstructed? all of that, that aspect of the process. Sure. <clears throat> um, I live in Sitka, Alaska, which is a really small community. And um, we have, maybe, maybe I'll share a screen and show some photos. Is that all right? Yeah, that'd be great. I might as well, I'm here. So I think somebody needs to allow for, for me to do this. Um, anyways, I live in, <clears throat> A small community, and we have um, a very strong visual language in our culture historically, which has become iconic in sort of way with with you know the totemic abstract art form is is <clears throat> is a visual language. It's a visual language that has been in continuum for ten thousand plus years of, of relationship to place and community and. Um, with consumption of culture and cultural economy and colonization, the consumption of our, many things in our culture, not only, not only our art form, um, our bodies, our land, our knowledge, um, the, the history even, uh, all of these things become consumed and, you know, pulled far out of context, they become monetized even. And um, let's see if I can share this. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, so this is home, this is Sitka. <clears throat> um, and that, with that shift, um, there's a, a shift in how we navigate, you know, what our work is and what it becomes and even the audience and, um, and space for it. So of course this is home again. So you know we live subsistence lifestyle here. Uh, live in a really abundant place where we follow the seasons for fishing, for hunting. Um, and of course we this is knowledge that has been passed on um, for generations. In and very short time period, you know, we can <clears throat> harvest enough to, you know, for our extended families and to you know, live for the year. <clears throat> but 
all these things have to do with our cultural visual language and our art form. Um, and with these shifts in this photo in the middle is my great grandfather, uh, George Benson, who was practicing cultural art form during a time where um, it was difficult to practice or in some communities even, you know, was uh, our in some communities in the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, uh, the Kuit and the potlatch was illegal ceremonies and that sort of thing. Um, all the while, not only was the practice of the culture, you know, <clears throat> um, made even more difficult or dangerous, um, the objects from our culture and our community were placed into place they say placed they were stolen they were removed <laughs> yeah. they were removed violently they were removed in all kinds of different ways um they were taken from grave sites um and and now sit in museum collections across the world and in order to access these things still today for the longest time you know i, I would have to buy books I'd buy every book that had anything with cultural like objects or art that I can understand, like just access. And um, in that time period, George, my great grandfather was creating and it was, you know, obviously a time of, that was not really easily, easy to, to do this sort of work. Um, and during that time period too, the, the shit was happening of work being created for you know, different means of surviving. So to pay bills for tourist trade or for creating work that wasn't necessarily always going to be ceremonially used or become what we call at -u, which is uh, work that would be, you know, our grandchildren's children's work. This is my father, my uncle, Will Burkhart. Um, and that series is based off of this very, you know, connected forms. So the form in that piece, I think it goes like this, is um, not this type of totem, which, you know, this is a project that I recently uh, finished um, based on our customary house posts stylistically, et cetera. But these forms are mimicked and they're mimicked in, um, uh, by opportunistic, you know, business folks and um, that are not from our community or our culture. So there will be somebody who takes photos of works like this or older works and brings them to Indonesia where labor is cheap and skilled at carving. So they're now taking advantage of two different communities in a sense to produce these ideas of cultural art that are you know, so far removed that they don't even include our community anymore. Um, and they are shells that mimic, mimic, you know, these actual objects. These objects have significance. They have um, history and protocol of how and why they're created and what they mean and what communities and stories are, you know, allowed to go on these projects. And um, so this is a, 40 foot totem I was the lead carver on in 20, I don't know, 18, I think, 17. And um, it was carved for the Takukwan uh, community, uh, Yanyadi community in Juneau uh, on Douglas Island in um, Juneau, Alaska, so north of where I'm at now. And the totem was a healing pole. It was raised, um, it was created and raised to mark the site of uh, Clinket village that was intentionally burnt down in the 60s to remove the community and make way for a boat harbor. So, you know, we hear conversations of colonization, forceful removal of our communities. Um, it's still ongoing in forms of gentrification. Uh, it's still ongoing in lots of different ways. Um, and this is a version that happened literally uh, <clears throat> a generation ago. The man on the right 
with his hand up. You can see in front of the is John, who was a child, you know, and living in that village at the time that this happened. So um, for him to see this go up, I think was not just John, but for everybody in the community, it was, I think, really meaningful to uh, mark and tell this story um, and to represent the history of the land and the community there. Um, it was a healing pole, so the healing process, I would say, was, you know, the engagement of this with community, the um, process of working with uh, five apprentices I've trained and um, teaching them the process along the way. I think that transfer of knowledge is, you know, so vital to our culture and continuum of what we do uh, and how our, how our language and uh, culture continues to live through that process. Um, so these are living examples of what um, some of these totemic works of, um, this is what I'm working on now. This is a canoe, 23 foot canoe. So um, they're living examples of how our culture and what these, uh, what this language is. And I think it goes like this, um, it takes literal, forms that were carved and replicated, appropriated or misappropriated, um, and, you know, sold for tourist uh, trade at much cheaper prices, excluding all of us. Um, and so that's where that series came from. I would take those works and chop them up. In this, play, in this case, this work was gold leaf. There's histories and stories of missionaries coming to communities and saying, um, you know, we're going to chop up all of, we need to chop up your totems. And and they they would even, you know, get the community to engage in that process of, you know, mistaking them as icons for gods or these other things. And <clears throat> and those histories were, you know, in that process, they were promised roads paved with gold or pearl you know the heaven conversation that is fed in that narrative and um so that's where some of this gold leaf and that chopping of that tourist to totem came into play for that conversation um also as a carver i think there's an interesting aspect to that work i do carve you know <clears throat> actual cultural work but to, to take that those processes and carve them into, you know, new conversations that t talk about our our um, experiences and histories right now. So, great, thank you. You know, it was yeah. interesting when Brandon and I were talking about this particular work and how it changes based off of every location it goes into and is really at the responsibility of the institution to create the, the way that it looks within their space. And I, I noticed that we have a question from one of the um, attendees that they, they're interested to hear more about how you feel about museums participating in the installation. Is that something that... I mean, yeah, they are, it does change. And there's a few other color variations, but none of them are gold, there's a black, and um, and this is, I think, in the Idle Jorg. Um, and this was a version of that installation of that work. Um, it's, it's not set. I've seen them installed in a lot of different ways, and it's always interesting to me. I think it was like this is also a reference to resilience of our culture. It's a reference to what was lost and what's, you know, being like continued or reclaimed. It's a reference to like new understandings. Um, and so in that, in that space, I think that it's, uh, you know, it, it's included with that installation that sometimes installations are very specific down to the angle of the lights and et cetera. But for that work, it's, you know, it can, it can change, which I think continues, represents a continuation of that life and conversation. Absolutely. These are, these are other works that include some of those conversations around cultural economy and tourist curio and um, again so these are similar carvings these are masks that were carved 
uh, in Indonesia and brought back to our communities, sold in like gift shops and galleries as, you know, in native art. Um, and this work is a similar version, but it goes a little further. This is um, a piece carved by an, uh, white, a white carver, a non-native carver who practices the art form. And, you know, I studied and understood it in a way that we can produce it uh, well. But um, so I purchased this from a gallery, a native gallery that, you know, sells this as native art and painted over it with this uh, wallpaper design, which is a French wall that references uh, European picnics and winemaking in an era, from an era um, that, you know, and here there's families gathering and at the same time on the coast during that time period, very different experience was happening in our communities our families were being you know removed and mm -hmm. and pulled apart and and you know um so that's sort of what that era based of this imagery represents um the process of it is even though it was you know non-native artist carving native native art as if you know <laughs> that it, it it brings the question up of is native art like an aesthetic like a color or a process or a material no of course not but it, you know with the way that it's worded and and sold and marketed uh, it, you know people tend to believe that it can be that so um, it becomes native art again when i paint over it with this imagery and create this conversation and work with it. So, um, <clears throat> and then um, let's go to one more series of, with those uh, works was Kill the Indian, Save the Man series. And um, that's, you know, these masks, these masks are again, uh, there is a, there was a philosophy that was, you know, upheld in the US and Canada of kill the Indian, save the man, this idea that you can, you know, remove us and all things that are not, you know, um, everything we are and, and, you know, replace it with assimilate, forced assimilation and replace it with this idea of uh, colonial or settler culture and religion and language and education systems. and. And this is a representation of that. So the process was taking these images, which were not even our images. It was, these are ideas of other, other people's ideas of images of us. So, you know, tourist trade replicas of, of, of us. And so taking other people's ideas of us and trying to, you know, carve them back into form and shape and this, this image on the right is the masks that are uh, the saved man or the saved woman and uh, so that's a reference to again that series and um, so well and that was the problem with assimilation policies is that they failed and they failed because I think the the policies were unaware of how strong culture was, that it continues. Yes. <laughs> Just the next generation, it's fine. <laughs> generation is here, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's really apparent that you, you sort of have two art forms that you work in. You work in your, your cultural art production that is very much for your community. And then you work in this type of contemporaneity art production that is for a museum space. And yeah. you keep those separate, which I think is really fascinating. They are, they are separate, but they, they merge in places. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, it's not my job to make them go like this at all like 
um, and have, you know, I'm respecting the community and process that I work within in that space. So um, for me, that side of my practice and that journey is, you know, I'm a student and, and I'm focused on um, all aspects of that uh, understanding that process. So when I do that, I'm, you know, it's life work. It's something I've been training for for 20 something years now and I'll continue to be right now. So, and this other work is uh, extensions of it and my experiences. Um, experiences of understanding how uh, the world, you know, not only narrow, uh, treats our communities, our, our, how the world, um, like, places us in these positions of, in spaces where we have the highest uh, statistical, like, numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women mm -hmm. or, or police uh, extrajudicial um, murder is the highest amongst indigenous men. But, um, those, those sort of things are real experiences that we also navigate uh, in this world right now. So um, for me, it's necessary to and responsible a responsibility to you know create works that um, are critical about about these things and and are critical about them within the spaces that we engage with. So. Yeah, you're you've had a lot of high profile art sort of moments in the past couple of years and I am thinking specifically with you know the Whitney Biennale the Sydney Biennale the Desert X which is you know ongoing right now um especially with Desert X can you you talk a little bit more about the Indian land project since it's ongoing sure um let's go there let's see and we can always go back and talk about these because I think these are absolutely wonderful yeah we'll, we'll go we'll, we'll go back to these spots too so this is a work that's currently up this has been three years in the making of just planning and um, i've been back and forth out to the community to prepare for this work um, which is in palm springs uh, agua caliente Uyula land um, and um, my first visit out to palm springs ever was probably around three years ago. Um, and I, you know, <clears throat> oftentimes when I go to do work, especially if it's land-based work, you go out and see as much as you can in short periods of time, which is always you know, never really enough. But um, and one of the things that I notice is like alternative narratives are chosen narratives that communities often try to uh, maintain and oftentimes, if it's anything, even like our community here in Sitka, um, not long ago, the, there was a Sitka Visitors Bureau that was trying to uh, brand our community's history as Russian American, because we have you know, Russian history from uh, a very brief moment in time of, mm -hmm. of the, the amount of time that Clinket community has been here. And that, uh, to me, I noticed the Hollywood narrative that was being, you know, maintained in Palm Springs. Um, and being, having an invitation to come out and do some work, uh, land, land art, essentially, you know, I think that's a field that has largely, like, excluded our communities, even though some of the largest and oldest land art has been we're the original uh, land artists <laughs> yes we ain't messing around like it's not it's not a you know everything we do is based on land and in like where we come from in these histories of that and deeply deep connections to it so um i was working with uh, working with uh, um some of these conversations and uh the hollywood land sign uh, which is not far from here, uh, is originally a white 
only real estate advert a real estate advertisement for white only communities. Um, and I don't know if any, many people know that side of the Hollywood uh, land sign. They say Hollywood land, and they, the land the part was removed, and you know it became this icon of sorts, an icon to an institution, and that an institution that it represents um, would could be you know the, the movie industry all these other aspects that are largely responsible too for portraying um, these stereotypes of, of um, you know, misrepresenting indigenous history, communities, people, um, and for, you know, a legacy of what film and cinema has been. So uh, obviously working with that, this is a, um, two scale replica of the uh, lettering, at least, you know, the text has changed to Indian land, and Indian is a reference to um, the legal term that the United States government has and continues to utilize to remove all uh, unique aspects of 500 plus indigenous communities across the US um, as this monolithic term. Um, to you know, continue legislation of basically removal of our communities from land, from land rights is less than I believe we indigenous communities own like something like three percent of legal land title in the U.S. right now. Um, fed, e even reservations are you know federal lands. Uh -huh. still. Um, so all of these things in, are implemented into this work. Um, the actual piece itself is not this sign or this image. Of course, people have a hard time getting past the immediacy of this because it's so it's it's enormous when you see it in person, and it's very you know it's a it's it's a pop imagery essentially. And um, and but the actual piece in the work is the uh, it's a call for landowners to um, return land, if they have land that they're willing to return back to indigenous communities, legal title of land that recognizes that indigenous communities are uh, necessary stewards to land and have been for uh, since time immemorial. And, and it recognizes that the need and care and deep understanding for that is vital to everybody, to all of us that are here right now for clean water, for clean for good ways of living in in a, in a place um, and of course if so so it's a call it's a call to action beyond land acknowledgement land acknowledgement is and has become something that's been more and more uh, you know common in institutional mm -hmm. spaces um, and that is something that hasn't been around previously for some time. So, you know, it's some form of progress as far as visibility, I suppose, but it's not enough to sit there and give a land acknowledgement and continue with the way things are, the way things have been. It's not enough to give these, to hold these conversations without action, some form of action in your community. And then, you know, there's lots of ways to do it. There's, there's not to be, there's not one way. There's a land back movement that's been ongoing in conversation. And there's lots of ways and forms of engaging in that from the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation in Portland, Oregon, who recently was gifted their space and building and land to host, to, as a home for their organization. There's restaurants in San Francisco or Oakland that have owners who have signed the title of the, the building and the land that they're on back over to the indigenous community, their restaurant doesn't leave. They pay they pay rent now to the tribe, mm -hmm. and that's that you know that's so so. There's lots of ways to engage in this, and um, if if there's if, if that's not the only way, I've also set up a GoFundMe, which you know is the goal of that is to raise funds that's the actual project the actual project is action over acknowledgement or after acknowledgement action after acknowledgement um, and so with that gofundme 
100% of the funds raised are going to the Native American Land Conservancy in Indigo, which is in the region here and there. Um, their goal, the goal is to raise $300,000, which is not much when you think about the amount of someone will spend on a vehicle or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a drop in the bucket. And it's, I think even the, I don't base this project's success on whether or not that fund is raised. I think the that it's just telling how abstract and difficult this conversation is for a lot of uh, American public to have, um, or choose to have, uh, and 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 it's reflected in the fact that I think that there's only been like fifteen thousand dollars raised so far. Um, on a project that's been covered by New York Times and Forbes and you know all of it's had lots of visibility um, that engagement though there so but the, the goal is to raise enough funding to transfer title legal title of land back to the, the indigenous community um, and working through nonprofit organization NALC who has sites picked out that are, you know, sacred sites that they don't have title to right now, that they want to, you know, uh, they're, you know, they, they want to be, care for those sites and, and ensure that they're not like damaged or like, you know, all these things. So uh, that's the conversation that's being held here. And um, I feel like I can confirm with you that the, Revolution will not be GoFunded. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some irony in that too, though. You know, we live in America, and people are GoFunding health healthcare. You know, they're go like there's these things that are like reaching out for of this like mm -hmm. uh, these inadequacies or these histories of, of aspects of things, and I think that's kind of uh, part of this conversation. In a sense. So, well, and they'll go fund ridiculous things as well. I mean, it's, sure. it's yeah. his oh, actual yeah. like decolonization and practice as opposed to just decolonization as a metaphor. Yes. And it, it's telling that the response to it is sometimes not what you would expect from everybody saying land back, land back and embracing decolonial concepts. Yeah. It's a conversation that's being had and it's being, you know, the complexities of, of land and how people relate to histories of land, um, the, you know, they merge in these conversations and I think that is um, necessary. So. And the idea too of this work was to travel, you know, potentially to travel to other communities um, and when it does travel to focus on, you know, raising um, possible uh, funds to return land in those communities. I've already had mm -hmm. conversations with other spaces who are you know, doing this type of work. And so, yeah, it's all native land. <laughs> I, yes, of course. <laughs> you can move. And so, then, yeah, these these ideas of colonism or colonialism is not unique to the United States. It's not. It's actually international, you know, these conversations are everywhere. So this is, this work was uh, installed at the Biennale of Sydney. Um, and for this project, this was done in 2020, almost a year, opened up almost exactly a year previous to the Never Forget Feast. And um, for this work, I went to Sydney I went to Australia about a year before and, you know, visited some sites and communities, went up to the Kiwi Islands and visited them. The actual site of the first, the, the real first like European landing on what is now Australia. It wasn't Colum or Cook, it was, um, uh, but I knew that Cook landing was coming up to its 250th anniversary in Australia, which if, <clears throat> but as you can imagine, these uh, governments uphold certain narratives and, you know, turn them into these celebrations of mm -hmm. sorts and they're very problematic. Um, the, I knew that that was 
about the time that this work would be, you know, that, that I'd be doing some work there. So um, Cook tra has traveled to Alaska as well, and, uh, as other, other places. And um, there's a Cook statue or a monument. Um, so it's a statue in Hyde Park with a discovery plant on it, a discovery uh, whatever bronze plate. And that's the story and narrative that's told. Um, and it's so terrible. As you can imagine, uh, the issues with that terminology and ide ideology, this, issues of telling history like that while uh, understanding the genocide that's been <clears throat> continued on, you know, indigenous communities, Aboriginal and indigenous communities, and um, also coming from, you know, one of the most like oldest known civilizations of, <clears throat> on, on the planet. And um, so I wanted to work with the, these conversations in this piece and um, I couldn't have planned the unveiling of it, like aligning so well with global conversations as it had. Uh, these are conversations we've had in our communities for a long time, you know, they're not new to us. Uh, but <clears throat> the statue in Hyde Park, uh, I wanted to, ex I was going to ex excavate the shadow. So this is called Shadow on the Land and Excavation and Bush Burial. This is an excavate, archaeological excavation of the shadow of the Cook statue, and um, what the, the it's a work site. So the goal is to dig deep enough to bury the statue, essentially removing it. Um, and while digging down, of course, use utilizing this science process, I do a process that is also. Um, problematic oftentimes and uh, and it's upholding white supremacist narratives historically uh, archaeology um, using this science to discredit uh, the discovery plant that's on the statue while revealing you know the history of the community and culture that's still here um, also in that process, you know, taking soil samples that will um, highlight the pollution that's happening in, in these spaces from uh, colonization and from resource extraction. Oftentimes that pollution is in our indigenous communities or faced with them. Our pipelines are ran through our communities, mining, um, et cetera. And, if you're, you know, like many of us in our communities, we subsist and sustain off of the sustenance of the land. So we're going to pick our fish and get all of these. I, it, when there's environmental destruction or terrorism, the damage to this, to our water, our sites, it's the health of our communities that is impacted greatly and generationally oftentimes. So, um, some of this work is looking at that. And the barriers around the work are a reference also to what, you know, during this time, uh, while this work was up, um, there were international conversations uh, that are still ongoing and still relevant about monuments and whose monuments and what do these monuments represent or misrepresent. Oftentimes these figures and characters are one-sided narratives and the the people that are represented in them, the whole history of story is not being told of the violence and the atrocities that they may have committed in that, uh, in securing their, you know, the process of whatever roles they were doing for these governments. So this was a site that you would see at the time, at the time when Black Lives Matters and anti-police brutality protests were sweeping, you know, not just the nation, but, you know, they were international conversations happening in communities and the police would of course circle and protect said monuments so it's almost like a, you know upholding these ideologies more than the actual 
structures or figures themselves. And um, with that, other conversations in the U.S. were, you know, Confederate statues coming down, um, the Roosevelt statue, and the bronze in New York in front of the American Museum of Natural History. You know, they're like really terribly racist depictions of Native men on their knees kneeling amongst Roosevelt on his horse, and, and it just goes on and on. Um, and becomes so ingrained into people's sort of psyche, they don't even realize how impactful it is. Yeah, completely. Well, I, I want to make sure that we have time for questions. And I just want to thank you so much for the work that you create. And it has been a really wonderful addition to the Art Bridges collection. And I don't know if all of the, the participants understand, but the way that Art Bridges works is that we're, we're not just sharing our collection with museums across the nation, but we're also trying to re define what is meant when American art and museums and art museums, what is being presented within those spaces. And I think that this type of work, I think it goes like this, gold is such a great addition to that conversation and talks to so many different other aspects of the history of museums and indigenous people and the responsibilities that museums have to indigenous people because of that history. So I, I wanna turn it over to Brandon, who um, I'm gonna let be the, the caretaker of questions. Um, and we'll turn it over to him. That's great. Thank you both for, for taking the opportunity to discuss the piece and these, these issues in such a, a compelling and intelligent way. It's just mind boggling. It's uh, really great to see people's interest and comments. Um, I posted the GoFundMe link and we've got some donations. I don't know if, if all the attendees can see that, but um, as we were speaking, we do have one question um, that came in that, that talks a little bit about your role interacting with, with politics and what do you see, what do you see your role specifically um, as an artist? If you could talk about that. My role in politics? Your, your role interacting and there's specifically talking about Secretary of the Interior. 20, 2024. Put it on your calendar. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, it didn't work for Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I don't feel like I'm politically involved in ways that are engaging the system we're in so much. I don't feel like it's been, um, I mean, I, I participate in voting and do these things, but I don't, I don't feel like it's a great system. And I don't feel like it's ever actually, I feel like some of the, some of the, uh, I almost want to share my screen again. Um, Go for it. Some of the works that I've created in the past have talked about the inadequacies of the tools that settler culture government has provided indigenous communities to, you know, navigate these conversations, and uh, they're not sufficient. They're, the tools we're given don't work for our communities. Essentially, like they, they never have, and, and it's it's just time and time again it keeps surfacing and in a lot of different ways and ways that represent that inadequacy I say are like the facts that these changes don't actually like come to our communities uh, <clears throat> so this piece is called I Dream Death and it's uh, porcelain arrows suspended through the air they're flying through the air but these arrows when they hit they shatter so they, you know they are tools and they're they can be tools or weapons they can be something that provides sustenance to our family or protects our community and they represent the tools that are like given supplied to us through these political systems um, oftentimes the, the process has you know never been in place for us we you know we were merciless savages we were like you know the the we the people is not we like, like me, it's, it's not historically ever been. And, and 
so um, to talk about politics and not fully, uh, you've, uh, you, you have to fully look at the history of that, of those politics and, and how they've been shaped and who they're shaped for. Um, and then I think we can start to understand that uh, these struggles in our communities that we're faced with are, uh, so that being said, I'm not running for campaigning for any like political roles or positions, but everything we do is inherently political. Me living here in my home community is, is political. I'm living in a community that would like, like to have removed my community from here. So um, me living in, and hunting and fishing off the land is political uh, because we've you know, fought for subsistence rights, um, and we're still battling with those things in our communities. So, um, it's yeah, it's it's these are real conversations that we're you know faced with. That's great. Well, you have your um, your slide open and your screen sharing again. Would you would you share the image of White Carver uh, that was taken in Missoula when you were? Participating in the in the oh, do I have that movie. image? I saw it flash by, and I was excited to see it again. <laughs> oh yeah, let's do it. So yeah, this is the first white carver. This is uh, this is Missoula, right? Yeah, there's Matt Hammond from University, associate professor of sculpt of uh, photography, um, reenacting your piece. <laughs> Shout out to Matt. Yeah, it's great because so many people were introduced to your work through that exhibition and have followed you ever since. And we've really seen a critical mass of, of support. We um, just received a, a question that somebody's asking, what's the most important message that you hope your art carries to all the generations to follow all of us? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Just one message, it's all I get. <laughs> 180 characters, one tweet. 140 characters, that's what a tweet is, I think. <clears throat> um, <laughs> they upped it a little. Give me a hashtag. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can distill it. Obviously, you know, there's lots of conversations being embedded into the work from culture, from community, from, you know, uh, social justice, human rights, from like environmental um, care of a place. So um, I don't think we can remove those things from each other in, in the conversation. So, um, but I think you, I don't know if I need to like say what it is in those spaces, I think we can, I hope the audience can pick, uh, pick it out from that screen, from, from those things, you know, and um, yeah, seem to find, I think it's a, that message is going to be unique to every, each, each person because they're in you know, their own perspectives and spaces. So. Great, thank you. I think that was it for the questions. If there's any more questions out there and you'd like to submit them, <coughs> Um, you'll notice that I did put in the chat the link to a, a post survey. I see some people are signing off, so I just wanted to um, remind everybody to please take a second and just tell us how you enjoyed this, this webinar and this uh, wonderful conversation between Ashley and Nicholas. The, um, Ashley, what are the plans for the piece after, after the Missoula Art Museum? Yeah, it's going to the Montclair Art Museum. So it's going to be um, over there for, I think it's at least a year, maybe longer. That's great. And it and it doesn't stop traveling now for, for quite a while, right? Never. It will never stop traveling <laughs> for as long as I am there. <laughs> when you... Um, when you noted that the the fragility of the piece, you know, the, the trauma that it represents and the fragility, we when we unpack the piece, we thought that's an amazing thing to send around that's got this delicate, delicate gold leaf 
and in these tenuous connections. It'll be interesting to see what the evolution of the work is after it's been touring continuously. Yeah. Amazing <laughs> that it's it's going to keep moving around. So yeah, we may be calling Nick, going, "Ah, we need a little help." <laughs> <laughs> never, That's what never. surfers are for. <laughs> exactly. We've got one final question about um, the canoe project and and when the canoe will launch. Oh yeah. Um, so working on this canoe right now. I've been carving it for three months. Um, it's for the community and. Um, Juno, so it'll be cultural use and uh, educational use. And um, I hope that we will finish it by June or July. July is what I guess. I'm so optimistic in this. I like the process of this, but it's such a slow process. Um, and we carve it and then we steam it. So we steam it and it opens the gunnels and spreads it so it's a little wider, seaworthy vessel. And, that's the, we're getting ready to hollow it out right now. So we spent three months shaping the bottom of it. Um, and then we'll flip it and hollow it out and then steam it and, and then, you know, final details from there. So. Fantastic. And you can follow that journey on Instagram, correct? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram. I'm um, <laughs> at Nicholas Glennon and I usually post uh, process work and studio work on their private bit. So. That's great. Thank you both for taking the time tonight and uh, really delving into this conversation. The, the, the waves of appreciation from the attendees are, are really uh, coming through. So thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, sorry for the difficulties earlier with the, the delay. But you only missed the introduction. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it wasn't. The introduction's boring, so. <laughs> yeah, fashionably late. You already know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well good night everybody thanks for joining us at ma'am uh, as ashley and nicholas sign off i'm going to stay on for just a minute so that you can uh, link to that google doc and and please fill out the survey all right thank you all and good night thank you see you take care